Nate. Weeks. That's yeah. you guys right yeah, that's over you guys. there. You guys are over there. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Sure. Uh, just because you're being thrown into this. I'm Roxy. This is Darina. You guys met Mark. We are right. live on air right now. Thanks. We're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you found the studio. Sorry about the parking. Yeah, it kind of sucks. It's, no, it's, it's, all right. it's a disaster. <laughs> of a situation. To tell a story about how terrible I am with giving directions. Why? Well, let's start there. You, you, you have something in common. Me, both, why and how? He's just awful with it. I well, I, Nate was outside working as a spotter, and I didn't. I was going one way, and I wasn't sure. And he kept saying the alley, but there's this other alley that yeah. runs the other side. And he kept saying the alley, and then I kept saying. Do you see the islands? There's an <laughs> islands restaurant. Do you see it? And he goes, no. And I thought and, it was a block down the street. And he's standing outside in front of the islands or across yeah. the street. And I go, you don't see an islands? And he goes, I said no. And I said, you don't see an islands? There's an islands <laughs> restaurant. Where's the islands? And, and then eventually he saw yeah, the yeah. islands. Oh, yeah, it's right there. It's, it's my bad. They <laughs> use super muted tones, earth tones in their sign. They a do. lot of beige and sand color. So yeah. it's hard to they spot. They got a lot of palm trees I, around the restaurant. I need yeah. to get some lead light. I get it. I can't even make fun of you because same. Every day of my life, same. Yeah. I have no idea where I am at any time. I don't know what if because I grew up with the GPS, but I cannot if you said to me islands with the bright colors, I, it's like I'm on Mars. Well, let's make a distinction here because Jimmy Kimmel has a horrible sense of direction. Ooh. So I'm in good company. Right. But Uh-oh. Here you comes. and Nate, it may not be a directional thing. It may be more of an emotional thing. You know what I mean? With Jimmy just has bad direction. For Nate, this no, is a this is a life direction's pretty good. This wow. is an actual all encum- encumbering life sort of encompassing uh, life way. It kind direction. Of feels I think gone. you just no, nailed, nailed it. it. I could yeah. really nailed it. It could there. be a little scrambled in general. You know, not just the radar, but the entire world. But that's kind of interesting because you're the producing partner. So is it yeah. always like that, or is this the constant not usually, dynamic? Just, just when Adam puts me under an incredible amount. Of Nate pressure. just <laughs> never understands what everyone's saying. Don't. <laughs> well, other than that, I usually he's, tell everyone great what to, to work do. With. So I don't, you know. How did you guys start working together? Was it on Shelby American, or was it? Oh no, we've done but, quite a few projects on Road Hard, Adam's first feature film. Oh, okay. Second, actually. Well, yeah, second. Well, the one I, the first right. one I produced. We worked on together. His right. second one, he also did another one called The Hammer, which is right. great. Is the, that how you guys met? Did the first movie you made together? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you meet? Like, what? how did this really We had a happen? mutual friend named Kelly, and he was like, I, you got to put this guy together with you. He's like, this this guy's yeah. good. You know, it's like a like set up on a, on a date. And I've been confusing him ever since. <laughs> No, I know you're confused. That's why I keep asking. That's why <laughs> most people, if you say, can you see an island's restaurant? They say, no, you, you move on. But right. Nate, I kept yelling, you can see the island. <laughs> Which they do have an excellent happy hour, just saying. It's yeah. actual PTSD I'm having right now. I feel exactly what you're saying. Yeah. But you just mentioned all of the movies you've done. You thought it was his first, oh, really it was his second. Yeah, we did that. We did a, a documentary called Winning the Racing Life of Paul Newman. Adam mm-hmm. owns and races a bunch of Paul Newman's race cars. So we did a whole documentary on Paul. We did one called The 24-Hour I've seen it. Excellent. Which okay. uh, they You're based welcome. the Ford versus Ferrari movie on. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, then we did uh, one on the first black driver to race and qualify in the Indy 500. That's going to come out uh, in January 7th. That's a great documentary. We can't wait to release that. And then we have Shelby American that we've released now. I think it's kind of wild that I, I don't remember which of your films it was, but I've been following you for a long time. You crowdfund so many of these. You ask for, I don't know, a small amount of money and you make like – 10 times more than the amount that you asked for because your fans are just that obsessed with the work that you do and they want to see. Is there some kind of trick to that where you make it so that they want to support it or it's just being your own I, self? Well, we've I think we've crowdfunded a couple of movies, but many others we, we haven't. Just, mm-hmm. just for clarity. Yeah, most of yeah. the documentaries most of Adam we, pays we, for we, out of his I own pocket. Ah, okay. yeah. Just because I, you're so passionate about I the crowd topic? He loves myself. the stories. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have much of a you know, business model or sense. I, we just pick a story and I go, let's get going on that story. And I don't want to go through the part. You, you know, so many stories take so long to tell in Hollywood. It's like, oh, this thing's been on my shelf for eight years, which we had some funding. It fell through. We found another backer. That fell apart. And it's like, all right, meanwhile, we're not telling the story. Mm-hmm. Right. And so my thing is like, just 
just go start telling the story and I'll figure out a way to underwrite it. And then we'll blink our eyes and two years or 18 months will go by and we'll have the story. And then once we have it, we'll figure out a way to make ourselves whole. Nate will sell it to an airline. He'll sell it internationally. We'll sell it to Netflix. We'll sell some Blu-rays. We'll, we'll figure out a way to yeah. get get back to whole again but let's get let's get going now why did you guys want to specifically make the story of carol shelby like what what, what have you always been a fan like how did this come about i've always been a fan as a, as a car guy although not really an american muscle guy but shelby and cobras and mustangs and i had a, a kind of relationship with him not personally but I knew the cars I knew Le Mans I knew the GT40s I, I knew the Daytonas Cobra Daytonas and I, I knew all that stuff a long time ago I was just I thought Shelby was a little uh, been there done that in the car department it, like everyone knew who he was everyone was familiar all the car guys knew who he was and so we liked the idea of doing a Newman story or uh, Willie T. Ribs, first black driver story. Like we, we like the uh, deeper cuts, mm -hmm. I guess, you know. And so when we went about to do um, the 24-hour war, which is Ford versus Ferrari, that story at Le Mans, we started getting lots of material on Shelby because he was such a big part of that story and then as as we usually do we started going down this road where we started collecting a lot of material on this other subject as we were working on this other story and so it became pretty apparent that not only was it a great story but just for practical matters we had so much material on this guy that right. that should be our our next doc how yep. long did this take you to get to to from inception of this idea and then it deviates to carol like yeah how long did it from released to now well we we started the 24-hour war i don't know i'm gonna have to get a timeline with all this 2015, stuff 2015 we did released it i think in 2016 yeah it was Prime. about a year or so mm -hmm. uh for that um and then of course we're collecting the shelby material and it usually takes about 18 months okay. i guess i'm never i'm not i'm not sure because we're starting ones as we're finishing others so i don't know that there's a hard start right. date yeah on this, a lot this of these. happens to us a lot like in our in our paul newman documentary we met a gentleman named willie t ribs who's the first black driver to race and qualify in the indy 500 and after we saw all the material on willie both adam and i were like why has nobody made a doc on this guy and yeah. it turns out he's tried to have it made a bunch of times like adam said tried and failed tried and failed and adam was like i'm, I'm just gonna do this why mm -hmm. was he failing people wouldn't put up the money people wouldn't do it you know and adam just pulled the trigger and said we're going to do this right now and I, we did it i think it's kind of amazing that you guys have decided to make your own way around the system so that you don't have to wait these 10 years yeah, or 8 yeah. years and, and you're just we've or been never. very yeah we've been yeah. Very, and but we've been very fortunate with you know amazon and netflix and the people who've been purchasing our our you know what we're making because you know and and what we're making is very you know very good product in the space. Couldn't and, and agree more. A Shelby American, we all loved it. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. such an excellent job you guys oh, did on this. You're welcome. And I, I think that something that's also kind of wild is how the universe seems to put out content like uh, when Darkest Hour came out the same year as Dunkirk. And it's mm -hmm. like, wow, it's been so many decades since this happened. Why did these two movies come out the same year? This coming out with Ford v. Ferrari coming out as well. Oh, is that We knew that. Is yeah. that <laughs> but is that helpful or is that hurtful? Is that helpful oh, because it creates more helpful. buzz yeah. for you guys? So extremely helpful. helpful. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Have um, you guys seen the movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. twice. So you, so you loved it? Saw it they screened the it at Fox for it's, us. It's, it's the oh, theater nice. next to Islands right over there. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't <laughs> find that either. Don't, right so away. How did you find, find the theater then? Yeah. You I, I, find no chance I could find you it. Make a look. We saw the screening uh, initially at Fox several months ago, and then I took my uh, <laughs> son to go watch it again over there in like the IMAX format. Mm. And I, I, it was very enjoyable. They did a great job. Um, glad that there's buzz and maybe even some Oscar buzz for it. And uh, yeah, it just helps 
for us with Matt Damon playing Carol Shelby, obviously, yeah. and then us coming out with the Carol Shelby movie, just m- makes mm-hmm. people interested in the sort of real behind the scenes story. Yeah, because you you want to know who Matt, you know, the Car- Carol Shelby was so much more. Like they touched on a little bit of what a racer he was, but you don't realize he's one of the most prolific racers in the history of American racing. Mm-hmm. This guy won almost half the races he ever entered. There's, there's almost no racer who you can't even touch that. So is he like the Michael Phelps of racing, basically? He of car racing in his time. He was extraordinary, okay. and he was doing it in the fifties. And the you know he stopped in nineteen sixty, and back then it was like it's a miracle he didn't die. Most of those guys died. So I know absolutely nothing about cars and nothing about racing. So this documentary shocked me in a million ways. But especially when we get some of the stats about how many people are dying doing yeah. this, from the producer and the car guy, all the things that you guys are that I don't understand. Why do people do this? If 25% of the racers are dying, if there's such uh, there's such a high risk at this, why? Why are people doing this? Well, I I don't know. I mean, as a society... Adam actually off, races a lot, so you should tease a very good person to answer this is. question. Um, I, I, I want to get it. Well, I, you know, I'm trying to think, like, maybe... When our society was a more religious society, people were more able to charge the beaches at Normandy or right. get in a car that they could die in a ball of flames in, in their, when they were 22 or 23. I mean, I'm an atheist, but I know atheists can be pussies, you know. I think uh, – <laughs> I am one, I, yeah, and I agree. I, I, think I, I am I, too. I think we don't believe in God. It's so. going to be hard to get an atheist to get out of that Higgins ship and go <laughs> take on that Nazi pillbox on top of that beach, man. That's <laughs> yeah. going to be tough. And maybe it's going to be tough to get an atheist in one of those cars from the 50s or 60s. I, I think there has to be a kind of a faith. I don't know if it's – religious zealotry and i've never even explored this but as i think about it you have to have a faith that it's not going to be you like you're going to come back like you're going to see guys burned alive but that's not going to be you and you have to have that same faith when you hit the beach at normandy like it's not going to be you and as an atheist, I think the thought is, oh, crap, I know it's going to be me. <laughs> All right? <laughs> yeah. For sure. So maybe the fact that we – that people in this society and in general – I mean, look, if you want to go to the fullest extremists, then you just go terrorist explosive vest. I right. mean, that's the most zealot religion ever. And you go, I'm, I'm 17. I'll blow myself up at a pizza parlor. You know, <laughs> what do I care? I, I have God Dr. on my God. side. Right. Okay, so – It would make you more likely, I think, to do things. I think that was part of it. I think there was also – it's probably confluence of things. There was like a chivalry or a nobility to like staring death in the face and doing it because most of the guys you raced were – see, the thing that's interesting is if you take a look at the populace who fights – Boxers, let's say, mm-hmm. you know, used to be Jews and Irish and Italian, and now it's black and Hispanic. It's the people from the wrong side of the tracks who grow up in the tough neighborhoods who have to fight their way out. So Jews used to be do a lot of prize fighting. Jews no longer prize fight because they don't want to get punched in the face. Yeah, they, they, we're too weak for that they've now. They've educated, we're in the banks. They've educated <laughs> themselves. Okay, so it's like the group that is usually doing the worst is doing the scariest, you know, or, or doing the scariest stuff coal mining or boxing or whatever, whoever's, you know, disenfranchised, whatever your color is. These guys are rich. A lot, most of these drivers were rich guys. Yeah. That's the craziest thing to me. Yeah. Like I think Well, they're thrillists and, you know, if you look in the, the like DVD Blu-ray extras of the 24 hour war, there's a whole huge section on danger. Mm. I interviewed a guy named Brian Redman who'd been burned in five fires. Oof. And, and I asked him, I was like, Brian, because I thought. After the first time, I would be done. What was his uh, occupation? He was a he's a race car driver. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a very famous driver. And he's still, still alive today. He's still racing. He, he, yeah, he got burned five different times. But one of the times he told me, he was trapped in a car at Spa. He'd rolled over, uh, and and the back then they didn't have bladders in gas tanks, so the gas would just break open and spill. So he was pinned in the car, but the gas tank had broken open, and he was up to almost his chin in gasoline. Oh. And the official leaned in the car with a cigarette in his mouth, and he said, "Are you okay?" <laughs> and he was like, "Get, get out, get out!" <laughs> but but he, you know, if you look in the Twenty Four Hour War, there's a guy getting put in an ambulance after being burned. That's Brian Redman. But he said he just kept doing it. I said, "Why would you go back to racing?" And he said, 
what else am I going to do? Right. Yeah. This is all I know how to do. Such a hard thing for me to comprehend. But the other strange thing for me about it is I would think if the reason is religion, there's just as many atheist women as there are men. Why is this such a male-dominated profession? Well, I think it's origins like a lot of sports or just dudes doing it, you know. So it just takes a while for women to come around to being involved with the sport like any sport. I mean, you know, football or basketball or whatever, it sort of evolves. Um, but I don't know. physicality to a lot of those that race car driving I would assume doesn't have. No, I mean, it, a woman could definitely do race car driving, and there, there was there are some good women. There was Danica there were, Patrick. I've heard there of her. Were, there were. Yeah, I'm friends with a woman named Lynn St. James, who was a great driver. Mm. Yeah, and they, they Janet Guthrie. Yeah, they, they've been there. Like there was a lot of women pilots, like in the 20s and 30s, like mm. barnstormers and all that kind of stuff. There was tons of women pilots, and then I don't know what happened around the 30s that there wasn't. So many, you know, Amelia Earhart, obviously, famously, but there was lots of female pilots. Because why wouldn't why wouldn't there be? They're lighter, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're lighter in a race car. Hey, weight's a big deal in the race car too. Like if you got a guy who's fifty pounds heavier than you in that car, that's a big disadvantage to to the guy. So, I, I'm the thing about racing is it's very much passed down. It's it's not a sport like the NFL. Or NBA. It's a sport where it's like the dad raised, the dad took the kid go-karting, the dad took the kid to the track, and then it just gets all kind of bequeathed. And mm -hmm. I guess they don't have a tradition where the mom takes the daughter racing or to the go-kart track. You, you don't get yeah. to enter racing when you're 25. you got to start yeah. go-karting when you're seven. You yeah. know? There's also an unbelievably high financial barrier to entry. In racing, mm. you you only can get very you can't get very far if you have no money. Well, you talk about that that father son or parent thing where they I saw it in the doc too. A lot of the people in the doc were the kid or the grandkid of a racer, and they yes. all seem to be doing the same thing. What I think is interesting in your case, Adam, is that you grew up not very close with your parents. You were a poor kid, and now you are a, you have, I've been to your facility with all of the cars. It's kind of insane. That didn't run in your family, though. Where does that come from? Um, I, I have a kind of mechanical gene, you know, that I just want to put things together and build projects, and uh, I, I it, it's a car thing, but I, I like building architecture. So it, it's more of a mechanical aesthetic I, I love race cars. I, I love the way they work. There's an efficiency to them that I'm very much into. That I, I think um, I think ultimately I like efficiency, mm -hmm. and and I don't like waste. Mm -hmm. And so, if we all left this studio and the lights were on, I'd circle back and shut the lights, and then I'd leave and go to my oh, studio. I, I, can I just shut the lights. Well, that if happens I, a lot, so yeah. we need to hire you for uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, if I do a show and I'm at a theater and I'm like in the green room or the dressing room, like some of these old theaters and they have all these lights and these mirrors and stuff like for the dancing girls and stuff, I shut everything before I go out on stage. Like I'm not going to have this room all lit up while I'm gone. So I don't like I don't like waste. It has nothing to do with money or my money or your money or their money. It's just I don't like waste. And and race cars are kind of the ultimate efficiency you know they take the alternator and instead of putting it in the front of the car and running it off the crank they put it in the back of the car and it like runs off the drive shaft because they're trying to get some weight even if it's a little bit of weight to the back of the car and then they don't put it on the driver's side they put it on the passenger side because they want to get some of that weight shifted to that side and they want to move it back and there's a, a kind of a simplicity, but a sort of diabolical simplicity to being super efficient. One of my cars, older race cars, has a switch on the, on the dash, and it says alternator on it. And I said, well, what's that switch do? I, and the guy built the car, he said, well, that shuts the alternator. And I said, but how does it shut the alternator? Because the alternator has a belt and it's running off a belt. It's like mm -hmm. a generator that runs off a belt. And he said, no, that, that switch doesn't disconnect the belt. Like, it couldn't. 
what that switch does is it shuts the alternator so it's not creating the the magnetic pull anymore that's putting tension on the belt and it's like but when do you hit it because you need the alternator to keep the battery charged he said with about a lap or two left the car will run off the battery alone it doesn't need to be recharged so you could hit the switch and I said, well, what's that good for? Yeah, like horsepower. He's like, I don't know, a quarter of a horsepower or something? Like not one horsepower. And I was like, well, what's that difference that makes? He's like, hey, something makes a difference. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that the other guy's not doing. Right. Like that. that's that's what it is. Now, I haven't hit that switch because I'm not, you know, that's a vintage race. But that's how race cars work. That's how the minds of the guys who create the race cars work. And uh, I appreciate that. That kind of thinking you drive all your cars yeah uh, yeah all, all the ones like yeah i mean i'll just say yes they're ones that i haven't for various reasons but i do is part of that like because you can and you've worked your butt off so you're in a position where you have all these cars you can afford that you can drive them and so you do it because simply you can well, I, you know, th- it's kind of a two-parter i i want it's because i can and then and then two you know, and invariably people will walk around my shop or take a look around and they'll always, I think, naturally point at a car and go, have you driven that one? And I and I feel bad when I go, no, nah, I haven't driven it because now I just feel like some rich guys collecting cars and looking at them, you know. So if you collect street cars, you can you can drive street cars. They're easy to drive. You can just get them and go. But also nobody really cares if you drive it or not because everyone drives I drove here. Nate drove here. We all drive, so it's not that cool. But when they see the race cars, they always want to know, did you drive that one? Did you drive that one? Have you driven that one? And I hate saying no. So (laughs) So I try to – I have to say no when they ask me. (laughs) But I say yes most most of the time. Do you not race at all, Nate, or kind of ever have? Uh, No, I'm – you know, I don't don't have the means that Adam has – well, because I'm, we were talking about you know uh, religion, I guess earlier. It might be a reason as to why people got into it. But uh, do, uh, are I you think guys those familiar? guys were like I've interviewed all those. I think they're they're kind of thrill seekers in a way. Yeah, well, that's yeah. What's and add. they they need you know it's it's part of what's you know like certain people are wired to it's in their to blood. box or well, fight, yeah. and certain people aren't. Yeah, and and, yeah, and I these don't, guys are wired to do. I, that. I don't think the religion got them into it. I just mean it, it makes them feel kept safer. Them, it yeah, kept right. them in it. Yeah. Well, have you guys? Uh, you guys familiar with Alex Honnold, the the guy that climbed Yosemite, mm-hmm. uh, but with nothing, with yeah. no cables. So sure. like they studied his brain, right? And it was different as to how he uh, captured fear compared to us. Like, do you think that that's something that maybe like do you think you have that Adam, yeah, because they, you don't care about race? They've talked <laughs> about like scared. you guys were you guys were talking about the female male thing. The thing about so for race car drivers like. The guys who race and win and are extremely successful, it's all about breaking at the last possible second. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, and it's very dangerous. The longer you wait to break, the more dangerous it is. And like women are a little less prone to danger than men. That's one of the things that we're Smarter talked about. Is in the, the other word. Oh, yeah. Just less well, dumb. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a great scene in Ford versus Ferrari where the uh, – uh, Matt Damon as Carol Shelby takes Henry Ford II for a ride in the oh, GT40. It's a great so scene, yeah. Bob, there's a guy named Bob Bondron who they talk about in the film, who is 82 years old and he won Le Mans in the Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe. And Bob Bondron has a GT40 that replica that has an original motor in it. And he said, "You want me to take you for a ride in it? It's called Hot Lap." So pretty much I – he took me for a ride in that car and I was the guy – I was like Henry Ford. I was almost crying when we were done because <laughs> you do not – and he's 82 years old and I thought, oh, what's this guy going to do? He was do? great in the dock. He terrified me. I mean I was just terrified when we were done. He's like, you want me to keep going? I was like, no. You mentioned Ford v. Ferrari again and I'm curious because you guys are so in this world. Does it make it hard to watch the movie if they get something wrong or they do that Hollywood embellish thing? No. I'm. It's art. You know, that can take a little dramatic license, artistic license. I'm not going to cherry pick things. I want to enjoy myself, too. You know, just yeah. go to the ball game, have the hot dog. You don't have to know what's in it. But <laughs> you already do know I, what's in it. I agree with it. Adam. I, I, mean, do, I look, do know what's yeah, in they, it. I do, and so do you, though. I mean, you know what's in a hot dog, but it's like you still want to eat that hot dog yeah. and just enjoy that hot dog and have a beer. And that that's what I do when I go into the movie theater. So you're not going to boycott any car racing movies? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that one, like, look, they, they, 
mixed up a lot of stories. You know, the Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe was made in 90 days. Yeah. And, you know, that was the timeline. They, you know, all of a sudden in, they're talking about the GT40 in 90 days. You know, that car was over the course of years that was developed. You yeah. know, the but, GT40. Yeah, yeah, the GT40. And, and yeah. so th- that stuff, you, you know, I'm with Adam where I just went in and enjoyed it. And, and I loved what the actors did with the characters. I don't, I don't think what they, you know, I don't know that Ken Miles' home life was what they made Ken Miles' home life to be. But they made a story out of it and it made a compelling film. And I really enjoyed it. They shot the racing extremely well. You know, I, I, I enjoyed everything about the movie. Honestly, I still haven't seen it yet. I saw your guys first. So Ooh, I'm, well, but I'm hoping that will even enhance know a my lot. You'll recognize the names because it's funny. Like a lot of the names were, you know, Charlie Agapu, who's a big part of our 24-hour war documentary. You kind of see him t- a ton in the movie, but you never, you know, you hear him call him Charlie and he throws firecrackers out the window at these girls. But you don't really understand what he did mm-hmm. until you see our doc, and then you'll get his whole story of how he's kind of like a son to Ken Miles. And it, it, it was interesting. That's exactly where I went. It's a perfect complement to the movie because I saw the movie, uh, dramatic, whatever you want to call it. It was wonderful. It was one of my favorite movies. And then this, I get everything. I yeah. get all the, the details. Were you very conscious of that, knowing that that movie's coming? It's like, we're going to give everybody everything we can in this documentary. No. Just how it well, we, were, well, we had no we, idea we what did, they were going to we, do. We did the 24-hour war before mm-hmm. this movie, and I think we started Shelby before we knew about this movie. So okay. we weren't really, we didn't really have an idea of what they were doing when we were doing it. Our plan was to be thorough, yeah. you know, and see if we could keep it under two hours and deliver all the info we could. And and you know, you have to figure out how much time. You, you'd you like to a lot for Carol Shelby's personal life, his health. You know, he had some very right. interesting health issues. Uh, his racing career versus his manufacturing career, mm-hmm. team owner career. You know, there's so many different facets to his pretty pretty lengthy. I think he died at 89. I mean, a really long life. Yeah. And he lived a lot of different lives as a yeah. chicken farmer, as an international race car driver, as a, a manufacturer, modifier, builder, team owner, you know, all that with so many different things. And then there was, you know, married seven times right. and kids and uh, heart transplant and, you know, so Liver much going transplant. There's so, there's yeah. so much yeah. in his world that you have to kind of figure out how much time do you want to spend on each one of these subjects. So that that's kind of the balance. The marriage one, and I don't know if this is addressed in Ford v. Ferrari, but the, you guys talked about how... Like, they don't even know how many times he was married. What does that mean? <laughs> because sometimes he would have his... Like, there's a funny story in uh, the Shelby talk where he, he had a photographer who was with him most of his career, a uh, very famous photographer at this point, uh, Friedman. And... There was a time where Carol said, well, I didn't marry that woman. And he said, I was there, Carol. I took the pictures. Like he had wedding photos and Carol did. And sometimes I guess Carol would have his friends pretend they were priests and then they would marry. He would marry this girl. And then, you know, That's crazy. It wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. quite work out. So, Do you guys have any uh, upcoming projects, whether it's as, par- as partners or separately, that you can discuss or excited about? Yeah. yeah, we have tons of stuff. <laughs> tons. Let's hear it. We're pretty much partners. Well, uh, we have, yeah, I don't do anything separate <laughs> from, uh, we're going to shoot uh, another stand up special of mine coming up in a few days. Yeah. Fantastic. We have uh, K Rock, the movie, the documentary, K Rock radio station we're working on. We have uh, memes, right? The meme gods yep. one. We're doing Cedric the Entertainer. Ooh. Oh, for, not we're not doing Cedric he's one the, of the Entertainer. entertainer. <laughs> he's, one of, he's one of the executive Focus producers. On him, yeah. Only if you're lucky. On the meme yeah. ones, we have a Mad Magazine. Oh, my the, God. Oh, the that one. Mad Magazine. What else? Uh, we're Uppity. Oh, so the new Uppity, Uppity comes out January 7th. That I feel like that's our – I feel like that is – the best. It's just such a powerful story. It's what, is, uh, our best. what is uppity? It's about the first black driver. To oh, race that's the one you were talking about. Five hundred. Who? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we met him during our Paul Newman documentary because Paul Newman was the one. He was the catalyst for actually him becoming a professional race car driver because no one would hire him because he's mm-hmm. black. 
Wow. Yeah. Well, your guys' content is everywhere right now, so they can wait for those, or they can go watch Shelby American. I, it's available now on your guys' website, chassis.com. Is that correct? Yeah, it's yeah. chassy.com. Uh, right now, the 24-Hour War and uh, Shelby American are both on Netflix also. Mm-hmm. But if you want the – my personal – I'd say get the Blu-rays if you want to get the behind-the-scenes stuff and all the extra stuff, and the Blu-rays look better and sound better. Okay. I'll take that advice then. Adam, Nate, thank you guys so much for coming in and joining us today. Really appreciate it.